in front of show. Well, first of all, my name is Jessica Angulo, and I will be helping the congressman out tonight with questions. Um, just to get a brief run of show, we're going to have the congressman up give a brief PowerPoint presentation. Then we're going to allow our panelists to give remarks. And then after that, we'll open it up for question and answer portion. Um, we do have uh, some elected officials in the room today. Uh, we have Honorable Diana Beckton, Contra Costa County District Attorney. John Marquez, Community College Board Trustee. We have Alan Miller, Director of Siege Sanitary District. We have Senior Field Representative Joan Carpenter with Supervisor John Joya. Field representative for Assembly Member Buffy Ways Uche Uachem. Um, I'm sorry if I miss anyone else, uh, but we'll have our supervisor John Joya give welcome remarks. Good evening. Um, First, let me say it is an honor and a privilege to represent Richmond and West Contra Costa County on the Board of Supervisors. And this is a great, great turnout for this really important event. Uh, and I, am, I know we are very proud that our Congressman Mark Bessonia is holding uh, this town hall meeting here. As you know, Mark served for many years also on our Board of Supervisors, and I had the pleasure of working with Mark when he focused on the same sets of issues at our board that he has as a member of Congress. He went on, of course, to serve in the State Assembly, in the State Senate, where he founded a caucus of California legislators called EPIC, End Poverty and Inequality in California. So our congressman in the legislature focused on those issues and founded a caucus uh, of members to address those issues. But I just, I just want to say, I know that here in Contra Costa, we care and welcome our immigrant families. We care and welcome our families. 25% of our residents are immigrants. 25%. And there was a study done recently that, that looked at the value of immigrant families to our economy in Contra Costa County and the rate of business ownership and the rate of contribution to civic events, it is overwhelming. And that is the message that we need to get across to others who are not here today, right? And, uh, I, I'm really proud, there's a table back there that I really want to call out, Stand Together Contra Costa. If you don't know this, organ, this program, uh, we, at the Board of Supervisors, we work with some foundations to fund a program to provide resources and information to families in our county at risk of deportation. And if you see ICE activity, um, you can call Stand Together. If you know someone who needs assistance, please see the folks uh, at Stand Together Contra Costa, and there is a phone number on this flyer for you to call as well. Um, and I know um, we're having worked with our member of Congress um, on issues here in West County and Richmond. He has stood up for people who often are targeted. We're, we're, we're finishing it right now, Mark, right? <laughs> I miss you on the Board of Supervisors. I miss you. Um, uh, understands the importance of inclusion and understands the importance of speaking out for people who don't often have the strongest voices. And I think that's why we can be proud from his service on the Concord City Council to on our board to serving in the legislature to now be our member of Congress. And the one secret thing I will always say is when he was on the Board of Supervisors, he would say, one day I would love to represent Richmond and West County. Well, he does as our member of Congress. That was because I, I, I said that thinking that John would retire and I could move out here. 
and stay on the Board of Supervisors. Now, I want to thank my dear friend and former colleague and still colleague um, uh, in public service, John Joya. You have a wonderful representative, somebody who's very, very passionate um, about West County and about good government. I will say he also has a, another position um, that's very important that I used to have. He represents the Bay Area Air Quality Management District of the California Air Resources Board, um, which is an incredibly important position when it comes to issues about climate change. So, um, okay, thanks. Uh, we believe in community engagement as long as we do it right here, so thank you. So uh, another round of applause for uh, our wonderful panel. And um, I want everyone to know that there's translation available. Um, we have headsets right over here. Uh, so if anyone needs a translation, and if anyone can translate that, that would be helpful. Um, and I'll ask Jessica maybe to do that again. Uh, we, I'm going to go through a quick PowerPoint. Um, we, we plan this out, obviously, to deal with the issue of immigration. That doesn't mean we have to only answer questions about immigration, but we have a terrific panel um, that will inform you about the situation in this country right now, but also here in California and here locally, uh, and get you the resources you um, so richly deserve. And um, I do want to thank, before I go to the PowerPoint, and then PowerPoint panel, then questions. Uh, I do want to thank, uh, it's wonderful being named after St. Mark to be here at St. Mark's and I want to acknowledge the pastor, uh, Father Ruben Morales, so thank you, Father. Okay, with that, um, I also want to introduce our unbelievably talented district director, Chanel Scales Preston, who's going to help you with the So we're going to we're going to cover a couple subject matter subjects um, focusing on immigration. But again, your questions. Uh, we want to talk about gun control issues, um, the sadness of the past um, week. Uh, we should do that. And actually, why don't we start? Um, I think appropriately, just take a moment of silence and all reflect on what's happened in this country in the last week. Try to go through this quickly. If it's too fast for you, we've got some really good content in here. This is on our uh, social media sites, our website. You can go to those, if, and it'll stay on there. Uh, this is our almost 90th town hall in the four and a half years I've been in Congress. So we do a lot of these. Uh, we do general ones, and we do specific subject areas. This one is one of those latter ones, uh, but we want to provide a little information. This is the district that I am lucky enough to represent. There are 435 of these in the United States House of Representatives and obviously in the other House of Congress. There's 100 members of the U.S. Senate. This is a wonderful district because it's all in Contra Costa. Um, I, I have represented West County in the past when I was in the State Assembly and the State Senate, um, so I should be familiar to many of you. Um, but it's a wonderful district to serve for Chanel and I because it's close, but it's also remarkably diverse uh, we are here today, later in the week we will be in Danville, very different communities, as you can imagine, um, but also uh, wonderful communities. I live in the middle of the district, um, right about where that Clayton sign is, but I live in the city of Concord. Next. Uh, this is about immigration. So I was able to do this, uh, do a quote on the floor of the House of Representatives, um, and saw this speech. It's a famous speech. It's the last speech Ronald Reagan gave from the Oval Office before he left uh, that position, and very conservative Republican, a Californian, um, but I want you to focus on what he said at the end, that we should always be as a city on a hill. This is a famous quote that John Winthrop referred to the Bible. Um, Father Morales would know this. Well, uh, Winthrop, when the pilgrims, before they left England, he re referenced this, that America should always be an example to other countries. And Reagan reaffirmed, reaffirmed that through his time in office. But I think it's very interesting, given the current dialogue, about how he said it should always be a city on a hill 
but if there's a wall, it has doors and all the doors are wide open. And that doesn't mean we have open borders for people who want to start screaming about that. Um, so this is important too, I think, as I've really struggled with immigration to, a lot of you know I like to read um, at long flights, finding good um, nonfiction about the history of immigration in the country. So we had our staff work with the Congressional Research Service just to go from 1790 um, through these slides, and I think these are, if you can go back and reference these, so a lot of people will come up to me and say, I came here legally, and I will ask them, well, when? And frequently those of us who had come from multiple generations ago, um, parents, and grandparents, and great-grandparents coming to the United States, we don't know exactly when they came over and under what conditions. So the conditions have changed, and I want to put these in here to let people know, and we have a problem in this country right now about knowing our history and the cause and effect of things, Immigration policy has, this is, country is, you know, the cliche, we're all immigrants except for Native Americans who are here to begin with. So all of us came here, we've always had a debate about what's the right policy. Um, and that's what we're in the midst of right now. The fact that the U.S. Congress can't have this debate in a nonpartisan way, conservative and liberal, is more to me a demonstration of how dysfunctional the United States Congress is right now. So just look at how things have changed from 1790. The Congress said if you were a free white person, you resided in the United States for two years and could prove that, you were a U.S. citizen. So that sort of frames, you know, how times have changed, uh, hopefully for the better. Uh, we go through this, I think the third one, there is a wonderful book that's recently out called The Garden Gate. It talks about this period, which I think is very similar, the late 1800s after the Civil War, and the Industrial Revolution, where Congress started to be much more active and there was a lot of racism. And ironically, um, not ironically, it was directed at the European wave of immigrants, but more at Italians and Eastern Europeans and people who are Jewish. And if you read the book, um, one of the things I find fascinating is one of the things that happened with the Irish coming, which I am obviously part French, but obviously, uh, not obviously, but I'm predominantly Irish, is that the steamships, both the rail and steamships, this new technology changed the world. It brought people closer together. You could travel distances that people had never imagined in the late 1800s. And then you could get in ships. Well, what happened was the U.S. Steamship Company had about 150 ships. They had a lot of influence in the Congress. And they were shipping timber and resources to Europe from this great country that had lots of natural resources. The ships were designed, according to this book, in such a way that the, they needed that for the ballast to make the ships get across the Atlantic. But they need ballast coming back the other way. And what did they use as ballast? Immigrants. A lot of immigrants from Ireland. So that, and, and there was discussions about that, but the Congress was very um, financially effective, how's that for choice of words, on how they would implement any kind of strategies on this. So it's just, I think we need to know our history about our discussions about immigration and how that plays into tribalism and, and race, uh, and have an honest discussion about that amongst all of us, especially in a world that, like that time, but even more so, is changing dramatically. And we know from neuroscience that we as individuals and often as communities have a tolerance for change, and then we go into our fight-flight mechanism. So that's part of what we're dealing with, in my view, in this country right now. The world is changing, and we're trying to adapt to it. Next. So I won't go through all of these, but this is just the compilation of actions by the U.S. Congress uh, in regards to immigration over the years. Next. Uh, I want to, this one is important. This was a bill that four Republicans, four Democrats just recently decided we needed immigration reform. We needed stronger borders, but we also needed to do something about the people who are here, who are a positive effect on the economy and our communities. Um, so. Uh, Senator McCain, Senator Rubio on the Republican side, Senator Schumer and Berger, who are our two leaders on the Democratic side, came up with this bill. It passed out of the U.S. Senate with overwhelming bipartisan support, and then it never got a hearing in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, we now know that people like Steve Bannon decided that this was a good wedge issue, and they didn't want a vote to come up, so it never came up. If it had come up, and if they hadn't driven this wedge between us then, um, we would have had very serious immigration reform in 2013. And in my opinion, we wouldn't be having some of the divisive conversation we're having now. 
So this is just some background. Um, just in terms of the contributions, um, if you want um, to know where we got this from, I'm spacing where we got this from, just check on this quiz, Ben. I, I'll answer once I get the question, because I always like to be able to attribute this. One of the unfortunate things about our discourse nowadays is people will bring up things that you need to know where the source is. So these are, this is a legitimate source I just faced. We talked about this this afternoon. But it shows that um, this myth that immigration is somehow um, bankrupting the country is not true. Next. Um, so this is some of the challenge we've had since the change in the presidency. Uh, these are just bullets that have happened um, in the last two and a half years. Next. I've gone to the border multiple times now. Um, this was my first trip. This was just weeks after Attorney General Sessions uh, announced the zero tolerance uh, policy. Um, as you can, see, if you can see that picture, uh, that was with a group of members. This is um, the Women's Working Group on uh, Immigration. They decided they needed one male, so I was the lucky male that went to go. I like to think it's because I'm more nurturing than most of my colleagues. <laughs> but it was an amazing, amazing experience. Next. Um, these are efforts that I've been involved with, with that group and others, um, trying to have a conversation about, first of all, stopping the things that the courts have said this administration is doing that's illegal, giving them more resources. We had a federal judge when we were down there who was a, appointed by George W. Bush, sought us out in the courthouse in McLean, Texas, um, and said, I wanted to have 10 minutes of your time to tell you that what the president is saying about who is coming into my courtroom is not factual. These are families who are coming. They, they have a legal right to seek asylum in a U.S. federal court. This is a federal judge appointed by George W. Bush who went out of his way to meet with us to tell us this is what I see every day. This is not what he is saying. This, we have bad people who come across the border, but we try to enforce those laws as best we can. There is a, uh, a letter written by the 13 regional heads of um, border security actually telling the administration that this zero tolerance policy was making it harder for them to kick to um, catch criminals because it was, it was taking their resources and spreading them out too widely. So, um, yeah, those are some of the things. I've got to go faster. Um, I want to talk about gun violence. We just put this in. This is hard to see, but up there in this corner is the United States. Down here is Philippines, Russia, China, and India. This is the number of guns in the countries, and this is the number of mass shooters. So I just think when we talk about the, the horribleness that's happened in the last week and the number of incidences of gun violence, we are an outlier. Um, we have a Second Amendment. People are protected. The courts adjudicate what that Second Amendment says. I don't agree with them all the time, but that's the way the framers created this country. Um, and the courts have said that local jurisdictions and state jurisdiction in Congress can do reasonable public safety around gun violence. Uh, so all the laws we have in California that are quite proactive, and I take some credit for being the author of many of them, um, like a ban on assault weapons, um, those things the Supreme Court has said you can do. Uh, they've passed the test, or have passed the test in the past, so that they are consistent with the U.S. Constitution, but you can do it. When you look at states that have passed these, people can still hunt, they can own guns, but statistically there's less likelihood of gun violence. Right. Um, this is just some more, and we're going to go through each one. But the, the enhanced gun check, you will hear a lot in the news and the news reporters who are here, we just talked about this. This is a bill we passed out of the House early on when we took control, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, it was a bill by um, a colleague and neighbor, Mike Thompson, that would uh, uh, require universal background checks. So there are, there are loopholes right now for private sellers, um, for gun shows. Um, we would close those loopholes. 85% of the U.S. public Republicans and Democrats, gun owners, support this legislation. It is sitting in the U.S. Senate, and we are insisting, we trying as hard as we can to get Mitch McConnell to have a hearing and have the U.S. Senate vote on it so people can hold their representatives accountable. 
Um, I would do more, but this is something we've already got them sent over there. There's no reason why they can't do it. Um, so, now we're going to go to the panel. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the order they're up there. I'm not going to introduce them all because we'll save a little time. As we introduce them, I'm going to let them go ahead and then up here on the PowerPoint will be their bio. So you'll see what their background is and why they're here. Um, but I want to thank them all. And um, as, they, as they allocate the precious resource of the microphone, uh, whenever you're ready, we'll stay up, start with Sarah. And please feel free to introduce yourself um, any degree you want, and we'll go to the next slide that has Sarah's bio on it. Hello, everyone. Oh, we should know. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was testing out this mic. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. You can stand there. Okay, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Gavigan. Uh, I'm a staff attorney at an organization based in San called the Central American Resource Center, um, CADESEN. Uh, I am also here in my position as, um, my position with an ALA, which is the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Um, we have, uh, <coughs> myself and someone else, who do our advocacy um, liaising. Um, we also have a detention uh, pro bono program that I help organize, which is we organize trips of immigration attorneys from Northern California to go to detention centers around the country, including some of the ones you saw on the Congressman's slide, um, the Port Isabel Detention Center in Texas, as well as some in Georgia, and also to trips um, upcoming in Tijuana. Um, and a little bit then about uh, the Central American Resource Center, just so everyone has some information. Um, we are in San Francisco, but we have clients that come in from all over. Um, the Bay Area, including Contra Costa County, Alameda County, um, and we are a social services organization. We have a legal program, we have um, a youth program, we have a family wellness program that incorporates health promotion. As far as I can speak directly to the legal team and um, more of how we serve the community, um, I personally, for example, do what only removal defense. Um, which is representing people in immigration court when they have to see a judge and they have to ask for asylum from the judge. Um, and so uh, we have about five attorneys. All of us do a mixture of removal defense as well as some other types of um, immigration cases. So if you have any questions about um, what it means to uh, do asylum law, I know a lot of us will be able to answer those questions. Um, if you have questions for us about um, what it's like at the border or doing in the detention centers, please feel free to ask. Um, and then finally, I would say, um, in my position at the Central American Resource Center, um, I'm lucky to also uh, do the work I do because I'm, we're part of a larger collaborative in San Francisco called the San Francisco Immigrant Legal Defense Collaborative. And it's basically a wider collaborative of um, organizations that are helping people represent them in court when they have to see a judge um, in order to stay in the United States. Um, and we, so we do that individual representation um, of people, families, children, um, and then we also help with our Rapid Response Network in San Francisco. And I know you're going to hear more about the Rapid Response Network when there's ICE activity in the community that's here in Contra Costa. Um, so I'll just stop there, and then um, any, any questions are welcome after this. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eliodoro Moreno. I work for Stand, uh, Stand Together Contra Costa. I'm actually a native of Contra Costa County over in East County. Um, I work at the Contra Costa Public Defender's Office. And currently, as a part of Stand Together Contra Costa, there are three attorneys. I'm the senior attorney. We have two others housed in nonprofit organizations. What we do is we're the ones that actually represent uh, Contra Costans who are detained by um, ICE, who are placed into removal proceedings before the San Francisco Immigration Court. Uh, free of charge in order to defend them from uh, deportation. So the way this works is um, we have a hotline. It's 925-900-5151. Uh, and anyone can call that line and then they have, it's manned 24-7 and we have uh, people that are dedicated to taking intakes and then they forward those to me and then we then proceed to make sure that they qualify for our services. In order to qualify, you have to, have, you have to be a resident, um, work, or go to school in Contra Costa County. 
and then uh, we then go to the detention centers to meet with them in order to represent them in formal proceedings. So we are sort of there at the front lines here in Contra Costa representing and uh, helping um, non-citizens who are in removal proceedings that are detained. So uh, we just would like to say that um, please, please, please pass our number around. Please feel free to call it um, so that we can um, help as many people as we can. That's what we're here for. Thankfully, the supervisors um, along with foundations decided to fund us. We have three attorneys currently and, and we're definitely uh, willing to fight um, this deportation machine that we're seeing here. And, um, and if you guys have any questions, I'll, I'll definitely be around to answer them. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jane Lee, and I am a staff attorney with Catholic Charities of the East Bay. We have three offices in Concord, Richmond, which is going to be pretty much, it's really close to here, even go across the street, and Oakland. Uh, we have walking hours for a couple of the offices in Richmond is by appointment. Uh, mainly we do family-based immigration um, as well as humanitarian-based. So family-based, if you want to petition a family member, um, do consular processing by bringing somebody over, or internally, uh, we do naturalization, we do U visas, T visas, VAWAs, DACAs, um, TPS. I think one of the things that people are surprised by with family-based immigration is even if you're married to a spouse or even if you have children, um, you're a U.S. citizen and you have uh, children that may not be, um, just the how long the government takes to do these petitions. Um, to apply for citizenship, it takes over a year for you to even get an interview. Um, for spousal petitions, depending on their status, it can be anywhere from a year and a half to two and a half years if you're if somebody needs to go abroad to interview. So these petitions are getting longer and longer. I think that's one of the uh, big complaints that are out there. Um, for even for humanitarian uh, based, uh, something like a U visa, which is for victims of crime who have helped law enforcement. Um, you're looking at over six years of waiting for the government to even look at your case. So, um, similar to asylum cases, long, long waits. Uh, to the point that some of the evidence gets stale, some of the arguments are not even valid anymore. Um, so, immigration definitely seems like it's under attack. And um, what else do we do? So, Uh, one of the big encouragements that we've had from people in the community is the willingness to volunteer. Um, people are like, we just really need to do something, so we want to come and volunteer at your organization. So we have a lot of volunteers that are helping with various things, um, interpreting or other um, things. I've also seen uh, community members sponsor um, immigrants who are detained um, by providing housing and making sure they go to their ICE appointments. Um, and I myself, our organization has sent a team to Delhi, Texas, which has the largest family detention center for women and children. We were there for a week helping to prepare individuals for their credible fear interviews. And that was a very eye-opening ex experience in that um, the women and children that are there, mostly from Central America, are really fleeing uh, violence and danger. And while the administration is talking about how could you bring your children through this, um, it's really kind of stay there to see your children die from these death threats and the real threats that are out there or make that journey in hopes that something could happen. So good evening everyone, my name is Lisa Arcia-Bagoya, I'm the only non-lawyer on this panel. Um, so I'm here to give a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I wanted to say that even though I hold an administrative appointment at the University of California, Berkeley, I'm not here representing the university in any way, shape, or form. I'm here as myself um, and as a scholar of politics and immigration and as the daughter of, of Cuban refugees. So what I want to do is just provide a little bit of a, of a human perspective on the situation, um, especially the Remain in Mexico policy, just to tell you my family story. My parents left Cuba in 1961. This was before the Cuban American Adjustment Act. And so at that point in time, you had to go through a third country in order to gain entry into the United States. And so my parents went through Jamaica. My mother passed her interview and was moved into the United States almost immediately. My father, because he'd been a member of a labor union in Cuba, that was considered a communist organization, and so he had to stay in Jamaica. And at that time, he was basically staying um, 
uh, on the charity and, and support of Catholic Church. So thank you also to St. Mark's and all the parishes out there that do such amazing work. And he was basically in limbo for four months in Jamaica. He couldn't work. He had no money because you had to leave all your money in Cuba. Um, had no way to get food and had no idea whether he would ever have a country again because he knew he could never go home and he knew he didn't have anywhere to go to and he couldn't stay where he was. And I just share that story to give you a small glimpse. Even now at the age of 83, he says that that was the hardest period of his life in the sense of just not knowing and, and having absolutely no control over what was going to happen to him in the future. I feel very grateful that the United States decided to allow him to join my mother and that they were able to have their life here. But just to say that those folks that are in Mexico are now waiting, in many cases, six months, nine months, to be able to get their cases heard. And in that interim, also are in limbo. There are many more large, there are large numbers of people. There are many people who will pray upon them because they know that they are in a difficult position. And so just to really think about the human toll of what is happening. And then there's simply the practical matter that at least according to a recent study in the New York Times, um, fewer than 2% of those individuals have access to legal representation when they finally do get heard by a judge. So unlike being able to be seen by these folks, so historically about 30%, which is still too low, of people um, requesting asylum have legal representation. Many people don't know that because it's administrative law, you don't have a right to a lawyer in an immigration hearing. And these folks, again, are going to have less opportunity to actually be able to make their case once they do um, get to speak in front of a judge. And just to say that claiming asylum is not a simple process, as all these folks know much better than I. It, you have to provide documentation. You are vetted. It's not something, it's not this sort of backdoor loophole. It is not, it's not easy. And to appreciate that these are individuals that are fleeing no hardship. And that is what that law is for, is that people who have nowhere else to go, like my parents, have a safe haven here because we are humans and have compassion for people who are in extreme need. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say, which I'm hoping we might talk about a little bit more, I think part of the, the sort of the chaos and the instability that has been true of policy over the last three years is really a product of, you know, a vision of immigration that doesn't have any sort of systematic understanding of the causes and consequences of our current situation. And so we keep making these policy changes, as the congressman pointed out. We have zero tolerance, not appreciating the resource distribution, not appreciating what difficulties that would create in the system. We're now going to ask Guatemala to keep people in Guatemala when that country is barely able to handle its own crises and challenges. And so we keep putting these policies forward without any real sense of what it's going to mean practically on the ground for the people working day to day, like all the wonderful folks up here, to in fact make sure that our laws in fact are enforced and, and work the way that they should. Thank you. How about if we give the panel a round of applause? I'm afraid I might have started a trend. In order to get as much information done, I talk too quickly, so I'll slow down. Um, but I want to thank all of you for being here. We're ready to answer your questions. I do want to mention um, Lisa has been really helpful, and the UC has been really helpful in an in a, uh, initiative that I started with Barbara Lee. Um, some of you have been to them. We started a conversation on race. Uh, obviously, has um, has importance in this discussion. Uh, so we've been having a series of town halls and the key contributor has been um, the University of California and Lisa and her colleagues at the Haas Institute, not to be confused with the Haas School for Business, uh, for inclusivity, uh, run by a remarkable American, John Powell, who uh, UC managed to get to come from Ohio State. And it's been really informative. So Barbara and I went back um, to the whole caucus uh, had lunch with John and other experts. Uh, we had 50 members uh, of, of Congress come down with the idea that we would re replicate this all around the country. You get the research facilities to come to these town halls and have members of Congress have town halls and have a discussion about race in America and bias and prejudice and just be honest and open about it, which we know the research is that's the first step to understanding and having a better understanding. So I'm very proud of the work we've been able to do, but we couldn't have done it 
without the resources uh, from the University of California. So Jessica's going to take over. Before she takes over, I just want to thank Jessica. She put the panel together. Um, for those of you who work with our Richmond office, she's here frequently. She's also in charge of me. She's in charge of her sched my schedule. So I'm very differential to her. Um, but if we could give her a round of applause. Okay, um, before we get started, um, we have two other officials in the room. We have Ben Choi with the Richmond City Council here tonight. And uh, we also have Rebecca Barrett, uh, Community College Board Trustee. And um, if you have questions that you need us to pick up, please raise up your hand or if you need a card, um, we're happy to, to grab them for you. Um, we're not going to get through all the questions today, um, so if you leave your contact information on the card, we can respond in writing. Okay, um, the first question is from Irma Report. Uh, what is your position on open borders? How comprehensive should immigration reform be? So, as I said in the introduction, and we're working on this because if you've come to our town halls frequently, a lot of the questions you will ask before uh, I speak, so we're trying to think of innovative ways to allow you to ask these questions um, in the old traditional form by writing or being recognized, but also being able to email or send us through social media as you watch the PowerPoint. Also putting the PowerPoint up on our, our website and our social media sooner, so when you come you can see this. Um, my position is I would have supported um, the Gang of Eight bill, which gave a pathway to citizenship for people who are here. It also strengthened the current border. Um, we have a bill uh, in the last session that was bipartisan. It was uh, Pete Aguilar, a wonderful Democratic member from Riverside County, and Will Hurd, a wonderful Republican member from Texas who just announced he wasn't going to run for office again. Uh, Will represents the longest stretch of the U.S. border in, Tex in Texas. So they worked collaboratively, and basically what the bill did was it gave tw 20 years uh, for a pathway to citizenship. You had to work, you had to avoid getting in any kind of uh, criminal uh, adjudication um, or and or be in, be in school. And then it funded more um, border enforcement, which we've had a lot of discussion about with the experts about what's the best way to secure the border. Is a physical fence the best way? Um, what the experts have told us, as opposed to the administration, is that that's not the best way. There are places in the border where that helps, but in other places it's more effective to use new technology. Um, uh, as part of all this, there was uh, more infrastructure need verify, so employers and employees uh, be easier to see, but it gave people a pathway, so I think we dealt with a lot of those things. Um, so that's my opinion. I don't know one member of Congress, um, and I'm pretty liberal, uh, but I don't know one member of Congress who believes what the President says that we want open borders. Uh, we realize there has to be border policy. We realize we have to be good neighbors. Um, but we also realize we live in a world that is global um, and is transforming and that we need immigration. This country has always needed immigration. It's one of the great things about this country. Uh, but we've also had a very difficult history in this country, as pointed out in some of the legislative actions, and a lot of it here in the United in, in, on the West Coast, the Chinese Exclusionary Act, um, that we've had difficulty in assimilating people who are not like us. Um, but on the other hand, we've had great success, and I will say for the United States, we are one of the places that tries to do this, and has tried to do this for a long time. But we haven't always got it right. So succinctly, I would work for, I would vote for the herd, um, the Heard Pete Aguilar bill, um, I would vote for this bill, um, and I would have Republican support, but not in this administration, in this culture, in my own view, this was a political atmosphere to, deliberately done to be divisive and to play to people's fear. Um, instead of being more inclusive, where most of our great presidents have been, trying to figure out how do we come up with a solution to a real problem that includes us all, rather than divides us. Okay, our next question is from John Chaston. How can we get more legal help to isolated immigration prisons in a much shorter time? 
from my perspective, that's part of what we were fighting for um, in the $4.6 billion that you may have read about. That there was a supplemental request that the president made year, months ago, seems like years ago. Um, and we didn't want to spend it the way he wanted to spend it. This is the way the founders founded this country. The, the House of Representatives is where fiscal bills start and originate. They wanted to start because it was the people's house. Uh, that was their relief system. Um, so what we want, you've got to pass these laws with enough direction and restrictions as to how the money is spent. Um, I think we should do more of it actually from a performance and good accountability standpoint. So we wanted to provide more judges, so that judge I talked to you about, we wanted to provide more infrastructure, more, um, more uh, border patrol um, people, but we also wanted to put conditions on it so that they would treat people the way the courts have told them they have to treat people. And we got in a little battle within our own caucus as to uh, some of the language of that that you may have read about. But we passed a bill out that will help with this, that will also help facilitate getting more, in, when I say more infrastructure, it's, it's judges, but it's also attorneys um, for the people who are coming, coming across and asking for what is their legal right. So, uh, hello? Yes, so I um, wanted to start about that. So one of the biggest things that we see being on the front lines representing um, uh, detainees and, and non-citizens and removal proceedings is we need guaranteed access to counsel. Um, as uh, another panelist mentioned, um, because these are administrative proceedings, um, you know, detainees don't have um, a right to an attorney without cost. They can have an attorney, but they have to pay for it. And a lot of times what ends up happening is that they can't do that. And just as you heard the, the statistics, they're very bad um, as to who has access to a counsel. But the statistic on who is able to succeed when they do have counsel is much, much greater than those who do not because of how complex immigration law is. So if the question is, what can we do, is make it so that everyone is guaranteed counsel in removal proceedings. That would change things completely. So that's really what we need. Our next question is from Tom Jancy. Will you commit to oversight of the treatment of children with special needs in Office of Refugee Resettlement Facilities? Will you write support legislation with strong requirements for finding sponsors for children in ORR care? Yes, that's a great idea. I have done a lot of legislation through my career for uh, the development of the disabled community uh, on the education community that's on jurisdiction. So this is a, that's a great suggestion and whoever suggested that, if you want to work with our office, I would be pleased to do that. Okay, this question is from Luz Martinez. What is the plan for keeping asylum seekers safe and alive? Well, this is the challenge. When I went down to the border the first time, um, there's a very large Catholic Charities um, the Social Gospel of Christ that I learned um, in my Catholic education. Uh, this very large facility that's been on the news a lot, and we met without any other government people. We brought our own translator from the group, uh, the members of Congress that I went with, uh, and we wanted to meet in this neutral source. Um, and Catholic Charities is shelter, I forget the number, but it was over a thousand people in the shelter uh, with a, a mother superior who was clearly in control. But at that time, <laughs> as, is, as were the ones who were trying to control me many years ago, um, well, they were trying, they were succeeding. But at, I will tell you, I have never experienced, I went into these shelters um, that you've seen on television. Um, but the most upsetting time was listening to a five-year-old with her, his dad tell what happened to him, that they came across the border. Um, they, he was put on a plane to a group home in, outside of Atlanta, Georgia. He had never been on a plane before, five years old. And he was told by American federal officials that his parents never wanted to see him again. Aww. And we were told that multiple times. Uh, I, I, my instincts told me that that was all truthful. Uh, there, was, there was a facility in Pleasant Hill that you may have read about where two, during this period, uh, there were two of two young uh, people from Guatemala who had been separated and put there. It took a lot of effort 
for me to get into that facility. The administration suggested I go to Southern California or North Carolina to look at a facility, and this facility was less than a mile away from our Walnut Creek District office. We have one here in Richmond as well. So I don't know how anyone, irrespective of their political ideology, could see what I saw and not be appalled at what is happening in our names. We need to fix this. This is a human tragedy. And we need to spend more resources in those countries of origin to help restore the rule of law. But we also need to make sure that people who come to this country are protected by our statutes and are enforced consistent with laws. I unfortunately am beginning to think that the only way the administration will enforce some of these things, given their track record, is if a cabinet secretary is held in contempt by a federal judge in This question is from Sheila. When you visited the border detention centers, did you notice if the children had any books or toys? If they didn't, can something be done to change that? At the time, they didn't. If they did, I didn't notice them because this was right when the zero tolerance had started. As I said, it was just a week or so after. But part of the legislation we put in and we fought for are things like this, but also things like uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes and reg regular access to showers and toilets. So this is this is a lot of language we put in the bill. We wanted stronger language, and we weren't able to do that. Um, but we need to be able to do this. All of these questions are about proper oversight. I'm on the oversight committee of the House of Representatives um, where we do a lot of this. A lot of it's done in uh, Homeland Security as well. But we just have to stay on uh, this administration. We have to do it in a public open way so that American citizens can make up for themselves their own minds as to what's happening down there and who's being um, ethical, honest, and legal about it. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in. Feel free. Feel free through this whole thing, or I'll monopolize all the time. <laughs> this question is from Jose Ramirez. What are you doing to address the five-year, ten-year permanent bars? Are there any bills for waiver equity, such as 601 or 601A? So there's the the herd Aguilar bill, I don't know it in detail as to, as to this uh, specific, um, but we'll be happy to work with you. So if afterwards you can come up or, and, and we'll be happy to talk to you. And if it's a specific case for anyone here, that's what we're all here for. So you don't have to ask questions so, for the whole room. But if people have specific cases, we're happy to handle those in confidence. And I'm sure the panel is as well. Anyone else want to, on the five and 10? Okay, this question is from Landry Wildwin. Do you consider inciting violence against immigrants an impeachable offense? Would you sponsor legislation to authorize treating domestic white terror the same as international terror? I'm always thankful when you ask a question I can answer succinctly, yes. <laughs> Question from Vernon Robinson. Under the current political climate that seems to insist on criminalizing immigration, do you think this will become the law in California? This is making it a criminal offense to seek immigration. Um, well, I don't, not being a lawyer, it wouldn't be a California law. Maybe there's some version on that. It would be, it would be a federal law. Um, I don't believe that needs to be changed. Um, I think. What we should be doing is providing the infrastructure and then having a larger discussion about immigration reform. So we should, this is a, and I would suggest for anyone who has, um, what's a simple way to get a, a little bit dated, but it's fairly recent, a frontline series, I think it was two uh, episodes, and they did such a great job about, in their typical way of informing people, not emotionally, um, emotionally appropriately, I think, about what's happening there and how the Obama administration struggled with this as well. They didn't approach it anywhere close, in spite of what he says, to the way this administration has. But this wave of immigration was, I don't think, predictable uh, in the sense that we were prepared for it. And we've struggled with it since then, and we struggle with it today. 
So um, that part is, is accurate. And then the second part is the larger immigration bills and discussion that we need to have in order to calm this down. I do think, unfortunately, that this isn't going to end, that, that this is going to continue to take place until the first Tuesday in November of 2020 when that election. For those of you who aren't aware, that's the presidential. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add one quick thing to just remind people. People want to stay home. Right? People don't want to immigrate. People immigrate because they have no other choice. And so as long as we deal as long as we deal with the issue unilaterally, as long as we think that our changes in policies are going to change the reality that people are facing at home, we are never going to fix this. So I would hope that at least what will change is we will deal bilaterally, multilaterally, work with countries, try to figure out what we have to do to let people do what they want to do, which is stay home. Sorry, just on the theme of uh, criminalization of uh, people seeking protection, I think it's a, uh, an important uh, link to really think about ending detention of immigrants in general, in, in its totality. I mean, we, because that is one way that people are, are criminalized without doing anything wrong but trying to survive. And so, you know, seeing this as a broader issue where addressing root causes of migration and um, and looking at alternatives to detention, including um, community-based case management programs, um, and really doing away with detention. We have, we still have detention facilities where families are detained. Where, um, and I'm not talking just about at the border, but you know, in, internally in the country, it's totally, from my perspective, for example, dealing, meeting people on a daily basis, going into the detention centers, meeting 18-year-olds who just you know, hold a fire alarm at a high school, or whatever the, um, it's really, really not um, treating people with dignity and seeing the humanity in people, it's moving towards criminalizing. So we don't need to do that. This question is from Mabel. The Muslim ban was supported to be, supposed to be temporary. How long will Congress allow this to continue? The challenge is that now that the party that I am a member of, um, Democrats control the House, we can pass legislation, but it won't get out of the Senate. And this is part of the challenge we have in this country running into this election. And then you have a leader in the other House that, that I think is um, makes it very dysfunctional. It's just like on the guns. There should be a process when a member introduces a bill like in the California legislature and every legislature in the United States, except for Congress, that I'm aware of. Um, it goes to the Rules Committee, it has a public hearing, and then usually goes to the Committees of Jurisdiction, so the public can follow this if they want, and they can see how the members vote and hold them accountable, and then we have to explain why we voted the way we did. So on the Muslim ban, um, I, I have a form of blood cancer that is manageable, my oncologist, uh, is here legally, went to Georgetown Medical School from Iran, but her parents can no longer come to see her even though they regularly came. So this is just not right. I mean, and we can talk about terrorism, domestic terrorism, it's not based on rational thought on how we protect Americans. It's, in my view, completely racist. So yes, you can look at um, where people come from who want to do damage to the United States as background and vetting from Homeland Security and the appropriate public safety, we're all for that. But just banning a whole group of people like this who already have to go through a good deal of background work before they're allowed to have their visa um, was, in my view, meant to alarm Americans and act like he was a great protector. So Congress has to overcome that, but it would require a legislative action that would take both houses to do it. Okay, this question is from Hala Alamari. I have been doing paperwork for my husband's visa case for two and a half years. I know I took every proper step in doing the paperwork properly. My son, husband, and I cannot live together peacefully due to the Trump travel ban. So what advice can you give me? I 
think you should come up and talk to us afterwards and we can deal with this specific case. Um, on the last thing, let me point out one thing on the muzzle ban. Lower courts, had, 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 there was a legal case and we're fighting both in the House and other groups are fighting to challenge the administration on all of these things legally, so it's not just a political process. Um, but the lower courts had all said that the Muslim ban was illegal, and then on a five to four vote, uh, the Supreme Court said it was. So this is the way the process works. I mean, you can go back to talk about how Mitch McConnell kept Obama's um, uh, app, um, nominee for the Supreme Court, uh, Marlon Garrick, who is a very respected member of the appeals bench in Washington, D.C. They just refused to let him have a meeting or a hearing, even though he was nominated and President Obama still had a year to go. So that vacancy got filled by Mr. Gorsuch, who was one of the people who voted on that 5-4 vote to say that the Muslim ban um, was constitutional. So this is the environment we're in, folks. It's, uh, it's, it's not a very civil, um, and uh, I'm choosing my words here. Uh, the, bench, the bench, in my view, this has been a long-term strategy of very conservative elements. Um, to dominate the bench for a long period of time. So it's more and more that the Supreme Court, ironically, for people who complained about liberal activist judges, now we have conservative activist judges, and we're going to have them for a long time. Okay, this question from Linda Wing. Are any immigrants being detained in facilities located in Contra Costa County? If so, are any children? If so, have you visited the facilities, and what are the conditions? Who operates the facilities? Are you concerned? I'm not aware of any, and we try to keep up on this. Um, for sure. uh, here, there were the two in Pleasant Hill, and then we had, unfortunately, um, and Supervisor Joy deserves a good deal of credit for this, there was a contract between the Sheriff's Department, um, who was a directly elected uh, uh, official here in Contra Costa County. He had a contract with ICE, if you remember this. And thanks to John and some of his colleagues, and I'll take some credit for this too, um, we interceded and said that we really didn't think that was appropriate. There was some negative consequences, to be honest, to some of the clients because they were further away from their attorneys. But we thought it was an important point of principle um, that Contra Costa not be housing people in these, these kind of things. They were housed in West Town. The one facility that I went to in Contra Costa early on, um, it's a very reputable group home. Um, I know this from when I was at the County Board of Supervisors, so people, young people get put in there in the foster care system. Um, so they have really good services, it's clean, it's healthy, it's, it's, a, it's a good place. Um, it's, it's licensed by the state of California, which is a very high standard. But I, as far as we know, there isn't anyone in the county right now being housed that way. Okay, this question's from Francis. How can we keep the issues of gun control and immigration separate in proposed legislation? President Trump has pursued for legislation to address both, but that sounds like a cynical way to stop legislation for either. Well, I, yeah, I think you should get them, keep them both. And one of the things that's interesting about how we all get information to you and how you receive it is, and we don't have to, we have had town halls on how information and social media is causing a real problem in this country, and we're not ready for this next election, in my view, having spent a lot of time in it. Um, so how we get this information um, and how I communicate it to you is, that you can do more than one thing. You can chew and walk. You can chew down and walk at the same time, if I can say it properly. Um, so we legislate all the time. We've actually passed a lot of legislation out of the House. The first one was H.R. 1, which would do more to help this country than any other piece of legislation. It's by a good friend John Sarbanes, I'm a co-author of. It requires fair and transparent use of funds, including independent expenditures. It would require social media companies to put on any kind of ad that's placed by foreign, anybody from a foreign uh, entity or uh, uh, people using social media for campaigns, you would know who's doing that, as opposed to the way it is. Anyway. Again, Senator McConnell will not let the bill have a hearing. 
Um, his comment about it was, it was dead. Yeah, he doesn't like that type of thing. Yeah. 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 So we can do both. I think keeping gun violence and immigration separate and not playing into his hand. But on the other hand, I think we need to be really honest and vigilant about the whole issue about um, what we've seen too often and this divisiveness of then having troubled minds um, who have racism for reasons that I don't understand all of a sudden get a hold of weapons and kill innocent Americans. This is what the Russians want to do. This is what Putin, you read about Putin, what his background is. It's not favoring one candidate or the other to get that person elected. It's about giving you no confidence in democratic institutions because he doesn't believe that the average people are capable of governing themselves. And there are too many Americans who feel the same thing. So this is why we can do multiple things legislatively, but we need you as citizens to do what you're doing tonight, to come to town halls and be engaged. Because he wants to have, he, Mr. Putin and people like that, want this election to fail because he doesn't believe in democracy. If we don't have trust in institutions because we can't go to the mall, we can't go to a community meeting, we can't have our kids go to school, all of that goes to erode our confidence. And then you know what human beings do when that happens? They want somebody, a great, a great male master to come in, usually male, and we have an authoritarian government. That's what he wants for America, is what he's got in Russia. So we can't let that happen. And that means that we can do more than one thing at a time. We can legislate on issues that are important to Americans to solve problems, which are, that's how a legislative body is supposed to work. Okay, this question is from Maria Baltasor. Um, she wrote her question in Spanish. Um, ¿Cuáles son las medidas que, este, que está tomando el gobierno para terminar el terrorismo? What are the methods the government is doing to stop terrorism? An example is the Gilroy shooting and this weekend's shooting. Well, hopefully we will put more money into domestic violence. Domestic terrorism, I should say. We should do more for domestic violence as well. But um, this would be one indication that the administration could give to me that they're really interested in doing something about it rather than speaking in different ways about the same subject. Um, so we should spend more money. The, the, the overwhelming number of terrorist uh, incidents that we've had in this country in the last three years have been domestic. So we should be spending more money on that in order to protect the public than we are on other things. But we should we should be spending more money on them. And I would be encouraged if the administration would ask us for them, those funds and the FBI and others. This question is from Sari. Refugees who came from Vietnam, Laos, Laos, Cambodia, as a result of the Vietnam War, over 15,000 refugee children who grew up in the U.S. face deportation back to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. How can you help them? We have to fight the administration on this. Um, at least if you have any thoughts or anyone else, but um, it's another example of what this administration is doing. So they came here, they were promised a certain framework in order to get to be here and to become citizens. Uh, they have been contributors, and now we're being divisive again. So we will fight them, um, as the speaker says. We will fight them in the, in the Congress, and we'll fight them in the courts. And I would suggest that as citizens, we should be in the streets, too, to protest civilly and legally. Yeah. This question's from Nancy Burke. Why do you think the camps on the border should stay open holding the children versus children going to be with their family members in the U.S. while waiting for their hearings to happen? I don't think they should. The policy was working before. Um, this whole thing about catch and release, and they weren't coming back. The statistics show quite differently, and I don't know if any of you want to share your experience. But most, most the vast majority, over 90-95%, were adhering to the court instructions to come back because they wanted to not have to worry about it. They wanted to become citizens. I would just echo and say that's that's correct. I think also um, to repeat, um, one replacement. For
for changing the unit, which is hard to even say out loud that it's real, um, but is to give them a lawyer. And if you do that, um, people are going to be exponentially more um, uh, prepared for court, feel more secure. Um, and like, like the congressman said, um, statistics that are being um, used that people won't show up to court are actually just false statistics, unfortunately. So um, certainly the cages should not exist. There's a totally um, uh, less violent way to process people, give them um, what's called a notice to appear, and have them show up in front of a judge later. They do not need to be detained. So that's very important for us not to um, you know, lose sight of. This question is from Nicholas Wolfinger. The now infamous children cages were constructed during the Obama administration. President Obama did deport many immigrants. Aside from the family separations, how have detainment conditions worsened under the Trump, the Trump regime? <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, if ever there was one. Uh, um, I didn't go to the border during the Trump administration, although my first term was um, Trump, I mean, Obama administration. My first term was during the Obama administration. Um, I think this was part of the challenge, is trying to deal with this influx of people trying to seek in asylum because what was happening in, in their country. There's some evidence to suggest that we have responsibility for that. We were successful in Colombia. A lot of the criminal activities moved, um, and they moved into these other countries. So. We have a responsibility, and it, again, I'm repeating myself, but in a functioning United States Congress, conservatives and liberals would fight this out in public in a civil way, in an emotional way, as appropriate, but we would reach a compromise that would help deal with the problem of the border. There doesn't seem to be an interest in doing that because of the current president of the United States as your representative, that's my opinion. He doesn't want to solve the problem. I've said this on television. I'm afraid that he likes having this happen. Um, he likes the divisiveness, he plays to racism, um, and it works for his re-election campaign. So until he changes that, and some of my colleagues on the other side of, of the aisle change their opinion, I think that's one of the reasons, and I haven't talked to him personally yet, uh, where Representative Heard left, I think this is part of the reason why I'm seeing a lot of Republican members retiring, because they don't want to be part of this discussion. Okay, this question from Kristen Law. What can you do to uphold not just the administration, but also the individuals carrying out rights abuses accountable to the American people? They should be held accountable by the courts and by Congress. We just had the Homeland Security Secretary come in and uh, the, to the Oversight Committee, and maybe some of you saw our wonderful Chairman, Elijah Cummings. And, and there is more goodness in one part of Elijah Cummings baby toenail than there is in the entire region. I, I say that as somebody who's, who works with him regularly and has become a friend. He's, he's, a, he's a wonderful human being. So we had the Homeland Security and he got upset. Uh, the, home, the Secretary of Homeland Security sat five feet away from me and admonished the Congress to watch our language and didn't talk about the Facebook posting that many of his employees were part of, talking about imagining raping a member of Congress. This works, <laughs> it, it was hard for me to control myself. It, how can you be a secretary, a cabinet secretary, and expect to have a legitimate, reasonable, difference of opinion discussion in a public meeting and, and, and admonish us to watch our language when that's going on, we should all watch our language. And those people are sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States just as I am. So doing what they were doing, I just find you're creating a culture that, we're, that is, is, you know, and for those of us who've been elected office for a long time, we respect and admire people who are law enforcement people when they do what they're supposed to do, which is follow their oath and follow the law and then let the process change the law when it doesn't work, as painful as that can be. When you decide that you, you can change the law 
based on your own opinion, whether you're president of the United States or an individual citizen, or God forbid, a person um, who's a public enforcement officer or border patrol person. That's the decay, that's where it starts, it just starts decaying. So um, we've got to hold them accountable and we will continue to, and we will continue to get pushback. But we'll do it in the courts, we'll do it in the Congress, and then we've got to do it at the ballot box. Ultimately, it's the American people, and I'm not trying to avoid responsibility or work ethic and try to change this, but we've all got to do it. When the American people decide it's bad enough, it will change, provided there is leadership in the White House and in the Congress, and there will be in a year and a half. I just want to quickly point out, I, I hate to keep repeating myself, but the way you hold immigration officials accountable is by giving um, immigrants a chance. I mean, you don't know how many times we've been um, in situations where um, non-citizens are being railroaded by immigration officials, and as soon as an attorney steps in, they're able to make sure that their rights are protected. I'll give you a quick example. We had one um, non-citizen who came to the United States. I mean, he didn't speak Spanish, but the uh, immigration officials at the border spoke to him in Spanish. He spoke an in indigenous language. And then later, a few years later, they're claiming, well, he didn't express a fear of return. Uh, we tried to enter, so that's why he has a removal order. But you didn't speak to him in a language you can understand. How can you possibly um, say that he had a right to express his fear? So we went in, uh, we made that clear. And we told him that they were violating their own regulations. And just like that, the person's placed in removal proceedings. That wouldn't have happened without an attorney. So that's one of the ways that we Question from Judy Weatherly. Resources to Homeland Security have been cut significantly. Why aren't you and Dems doing a better job of educating people about how much has been cut off, especially in terms of fighting domestic terrorism and white supremacy? Did she say that it's declined? Mm -hmm. yes. To Homeland Security? For that specific area that has been monitored. So, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify because we haven't cut funds for Homeland Security, we've added funds, but specifically for domestic. That's a good point and we shouldn't assist that language in any appropriations bill. Given what's happened, as I said in an earlier question, we should be having more accountability and giving more resources to public safety to make sure that domestic terrorism stops or is slowed. Okay, I'm happy to have a conversation. There, there is, from what I've been told, there's ample statutory authority to get the FBI and other public agencies to do it, but if we can make it tougher, I'm all in. Question from Virginia Frederick. Why could the Gilroy shooter buy weapons that is outlawed, outlawed in California? Why wasn't he ID checked and the laws of his state of residency applied? So that's a great question. That's why we need a federal law. Um, so he bought a, uh, this rifle. He was living at the time in Nevada. So he bought it even though he wouldn't be allowed to buy it because he was too young in California. And he wouldn't have been allowed to buy it because the, the assault weapon is banned in California. He broke the law when he came into California with it. And if he'd been stopped in a, in, um, a law enforcement person found it, he would have been adjudicated for that. But this is a perfect example of why we need federal legislation. You can't build a border around every state, um, nor would we want one, but you need federal legislation. It's too easy for people to go from one state to the other. In this instance, he, he had a, a, a place he was living that legally in the uh, And that's about his loss. I mean, I was thinking this morning um, about I don't know if this is possible. Would, would somebody be able to sue one of the people who who's had a family member, perhaps, that at that event, could they sue the state of Nevada? Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but a creative attorney might come up with a case. Questions from Susan. Thank you for visiting immigrant detention facilities. Thank you for supporting an impeachment inquiry. Do you believe impeachment is justified for the president's encouragement of violence in policies against immigrants at the border, rallies, and racist text and speech? 
I was trying to do two things at once, and I didn't do it very well. Um, so, impeachment for the presidency. Uh, I was the 14th member of the Congress to sign on to impeachment papers. I have um, framed printouts from um, Representative Al Green, who's brought them to the floor three times, and I think we started with 55 and we've grown each time. Um, but I do think the speaker has a legitimate process. It's the strategy is to remove this person from office um, for the sake of the country. It's going to take time, and you have a Republican-controlled um, Senate, and you need a supermajority there. So, and I think also the speaker is worried that um, we might create a situation where some people in some states that he needs to win would be more sympathetic with him. Now, remember, this last presidential election, the popular vote was was given to Secretary Clinton overwhelmingly in this in this in this congressional district, she won the vote by almost 205,000 votes. Now, he got to be president by 77,000 votes in very targeted parts of the country. And whether you agree with it or not, it's part of the Constitution of the United States. I would have mind it's there because of the country struggling with slavery at that time, that you have the Electoral College. There are constitutional lawyers who would argue that and say it was it was, and there's language in the Federalist Papers about this, about how it would temper popular opinion running uh, and picking a president they should have, shouldn't have. I, don't, I think you got it the wrong way. So, the process to, to get the American public to make sure that this gentleman is no longer in office is a public process. And being old enough to remember Watergate, remember what happened to Watergate. It wasn't the House starting impeachment proceedings, it was the Senate and Senator Irvin and Howard Baker as the ranking Republican holding those public hearings over Watergate. That's what changed the public against Richard Nixon to the point where Senator Barry Goldwater drove down to the White House and said, you need to resign because as soon as they do introduce impeachment proceedings, there are no votes in the Senate to defend you. So we have to think about the history of this, how it was constructed, how it's worked effectively and how it might not work for us. It's going to take a long time to do this. A year from now, folks, we will be past most of the primaries. The California primary will be March. Most of the big part of the primaries will be all done. We're deep into this election cycle. So that's part of democracy and part of being civically engaged. And if we're not engaged in fighting for that, um, I, I'd like to tell a story. John Kennedy said in his first inaugural, there are few generations in history that are given the responsibility to den defend freedom in its ultimate moment of peril. That was somebody who was a combat veteran in World War II and meant the Soviet Union and communism. For all of us, we don't have to go to war, but we have to defend democracy. And what I would argue in my lifetime is its ultimate moment of peril. Questions from Guadalupe. How can you assure the community's safety when it comes to the census count and acquiring accuracy for communities and the funding coming from it with the citizenship question? Well, fortunately, as of right now, the citizenship question will not be on the document um, based on a 5 4 decision that was mostly because of. Um, the way they went about it and things that we caught them at in the oversight committee and having had the opportunity to fairly intensely by the chair of the committee, Elijah Cummings, ask questions for Secretary Ross. Um, he, we have documents that show, he, he said uh, that he, he claimed that the Department of Justice asked this question. We have documents from whistleblowers that refute that that he actually asked the Justice Department to ask the Department of Commerce to ask the question. So, if it's not on, on the census, that will help us. Um, in addition to that, the state of California and other places are really putting money and efforts in making sure that everyone knows what their rights are, what their responsibilities are, what their risks are. So we're trying very hard. Um, there, 
with with this question. Um, I think California, from what I've read, will lose one vote in the House of Representatives, um, or we won't lose any. Uh, and most likely that vote would go to Texas uh, because they're growing more than we are. Um, if we get the census done legally, uh, we'll probably say the same number, which is 53 members of Congress and only seven of them being um, in the minority party, which is, I would think, advantageous to this country. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to have your question answered, please leave your contact information and we'll respond in writing. This question is from Raylene. What are some of the creative ways you and your colleagues have pushed back against Trump's immigration policy and child separation? What are the best ways for local citizens to help immigrants fight deportations? Well, we've gone down there multiple times. I'm going to go down there um, within the next three weeks, four weeks. Um, we'll try to find a time to go down there. So we keep going down. Uh, we keep passing legislation. Uh, Speaker Pelosi has been tenacious to get as much language in there as possible to protect it. We keep supporting people who bring lawsuits um, to try to protect them in the courts. So everything we possibly can. And then lastly, uh, we keep doing events like this and trying to insist that, that Congress should have a real discussion about immigration in this country and at this point lots of other things, but immigration and passing meaningful legislation that will be problem solving directed, but would also for the people who've been an integral part of our economy not have to stay awake at night worrying about whether they or their kids are going to be removed from their home. I went down to the UCLA Labor Center a few years ago for this program um, that I supported in the legislature for Dreamers, where these wonderful people are culturally competent, they're helping people understand how they can get an education in California. And the young lady I met with, graduated from UCLA with a 4.2. Now this is before all of this. This is five years ago. And she said to me very plainly but emotionally, I, this is my country, I know. This is where I grew up. I don't have family or friends that I'm aware of where my parents came from. How could a country that was fair and reasonable and compassionate, I did what you wanted me to do. I got a 4.2, I'm contributing. I can't imagine a country coming and taking me out of my home and sending me somewhere that isn't my country. So this, this was part of the dreamers. So we just have to keep fighting as much as we can. Just, are we going to do one more question? Because I want to, I've dominated this, not by design. I want to give all of the panelists a chance to say something before we leave. Want to do one more question? Um, last question is the last question is uh, closing remarks from the panelists. Any last words? <laughs> So I should say, if your questions didn't get answered, we all, what we do is, and they work very hard in the office, as long as we have uh, an address, either a mailing address or an electronic address, we will answer your question and respond to you. So just because we didn't get to you doesn't mean we won't address the question. I guess the only thing I want to say, sorry, standing up last time is to repeat what the congressman said in the sense of the importance of all of us being aware of what's going on, of very things that are being done in our name and to make clear that treating human beings inhumanely and putting them in cages is not what we do as a country, it's not what we should be doing as a society, and that it's all of our responsibility to make sure that people are held accountable for what's
could have uh, detained folks who have to purchase it, which means you have to have somebody like giving you money to get it. Um, I, I think in the what I've heard in the, the cages, they can keep it intentionally cold because they don't want bacteria to fester or if there's any diseases, but also um, some of, one woman with two kids was saying when they got there, they crossed the river so they're wet and their clothes didn't dry for four days. Um, the kids, many, many people had colds. So um, the other thing is while in the middle of the night, the officers will come and wake them up to do roll call. And I think a lot of it is the rhetoric, um, the treatment of the people. Um, a lot of the women were, were saying those holding cells were, were terrible. They really didn't like it, the guards mistreated them. So um, I suspect probably sort of the rhetoric and the okay to treat people with that idea that they can kind of get away with that might be part of the difference in the administration. Just very quickly, I just want to say practically, I think how can everyone help and get involved? I think that you can volunteer your time at nonprofit organizations and also donate your money to nonprofit organizations. So here at Stand Together Contra Costa, we have five nonprofits that are in collaboration with the Contra Costa Public Defender's Office. We have Catholic Charities of the East Bay, Jewish Family Community Services, the Immigration Institute of the Bay Area. Um, we also have the Bay Area Community Resource. Um, center. So all of us are working to, uh, together to try to help people who are undocumented, who need to be guided both through removal proceedings and also other services. Um, we also have Monument Impact there in Concord, which is providing services to people with uh, non, um, uh, undocumented persons in the wide range of areas, not just in legal defense. So if you, how you often get involved, help these organizations out. All of this craziness and, and, and really just um, things that get you really downtrodden. Um, we, I work a lot with unaccompanied children. Those are children that cross the border without a guardian, or they might be separated, to be honest. Um, and one, one young man, his name is Benicio, um, he uh, finished his case, he won his asylum case with us, and he wanted to give back to the community, to, to our organization. And, um, so with a few hundred dollars, he came in one day with a few hundred dollars. So, so surprised. And he wanted to just thank you. I want to just give this to you. Well, of course, we said, let's think of a more creative thing to do with this money. So, in fact, we started with his money, something called the Benicio Fund. And it's money that we collect. It just passes through our organization. It goes directly back to other unaccompanied children that have needs like they um, can't get a bus pass to CS to see their attorney. They have a need lunch that day. They need a medical exam. All of it goes right back into the pockets of other children in his situation. It's called the Benicio Fund. You can find it on our website, the link, um, cutsnsf.org. And um, it's just a really nice uh, community started um, uh, fund that at least um, you know is doing something to uh, help the basic needs of children, especially access their attorneys if they live in Contra Costa and have to come to San Francisco. Um, I want to thank the panel again. I'm sorry that I took up uh, so much of the time. I want to thank Jessica for the terrific job she did. Um, I also want to acknowledge our terrific uh, district attorney. Uh, you elected the first woman in the history of Contra Costa County. three or four more town halls. We're trying to get to 100. Um, so feel free to come to those. We didn't live stream this one. We normally do, but we weren't able to get Contra Costa TV because they were busy. So thank you so very much, um, and please stay engaged.